Let's begin with prayer. Father, the psalmist has written, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows honor and favor. No good thing does he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Help us by your spirit to walk in your ways. Be with Steve Levitt as he leads worship. And Michael as he leads us in intercession for the church. And our pastor that we may be enabled by your spirit to have Christ honorable marriages. And we ask this in Jesus name. Amen. Good morning. Before we begin our worship service this morning, we wanted to share some things from the session. Uh, several months ago, um, a proposal was brought forth to the session for Exeter Presbyterian to become a sponsor of uh, program, uh, programs for boys and girls, uh, Trail Life and American Heritage Girls. And so um, we agreed to do that and um, asked Nancy Camp to take the lead in uh, beginning to organize this. At this point, Exeter Presbyterian has actually been approved as a sponsor for each of these programs. So there's been a few steps to work through and um, we thought it would be good for Nancy to just share a little bit about um, this pro these programs and uh, where they're headed and, and kind of what our needs are um, going into the next few months. You get to hear from me two weeks in a row. Last week was for the babies and hopefully your bottles are getting filled. And this week it's for older children. And that includes everybody from a, this group services anybody from five years up. Um, there are two organizations. Uh, they were both formed in response to the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America moving away from their foundational standards. And what I wanted to tell you, I want to read you their, both of their mission statements, because I think that kind of encompasses what they are. The girls are the American Heritage Girls, and what they do is they train girls to become Christ-following servants in the areas of faith, leadership, citizenship, life skills, social and emotional interactions, and outdoors, anchoring each of these in Christ. And it, 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 very, it is very Christ-centered, and that's what's so important. Um, for the boys, their mission statement is, um, this is Trail Life, to become Christian men of character and conviction. We need our boys to become men, okay? And not only just men, we need them to have the conviction and the character of Christian men. This is to guide young men to honor God lead with integrity, serve others, and experience outdoor adventures. Now, where is our church standing right now? Right now, we are on the beginnings of forming the boards for these two organizations, which is what we have to do next, and then moving on to actually having children participate in the troops. If you have any desire to help at all, please come see me. Okay, because I need help. I can't do this on my own. And I, I'm going to leave you with this. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to do this for our kids today. We need to do it all of history, but I think we need to do it more today than ever. And I would like to have people help me out with that endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, would you stand with me for our call to worship from Psalm 95? O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's open singing hymn number 135, Praise the Lord, His Praise Proclaim.
be seated. Let's go to the Lord and the throne of grace in prayer. Our gracious heavenly father, you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Your faithfulness to all generations. You made us. We are yours. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. And as our shepherd, you have called us. And we have heard your voice. Come and worship the Lord your God. So we have gathered to worship as your people. We come with confidence and trust in you and in you alone. We've come to make a joyful noise with singing, 
with praising and in giving thanks. We've come to serve and honor and glorify you. We pray that as we worship today, you would fill us with gladness, that you would fill us with your presence, and that you would receive our praise as we bless your name. For you are God, and there is no other. We pray this in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. seated. In our consideration of the law of God this morning, we're looking at the ninth commandment. I should know what it says, shouldn't I? Because I'm speaking on it. <laughs> Shall not bear false witness against your neighbors, right? You know, it's an interesting commandment. I'm just thinking a little bit about the history behind it. Perhaps thinking about uh, in Exodus chapter 18, remember Jeth uh, Jethro, Moses' father in law, comes and, and tells Moses, The work you're doing is too hard for you to do alone. You know that passage. And so these people, men, were called to be judges and to listen to disputes. And to resolve a dispute, what would be necessary? Witnesses, you know to be able to hear from two sides of a dispute. And so we have this commandment that we shouldn't bear false witness. Later on in, in Deuteronomy, the Lord talks about how, you know, two witnesses are good. <laughs> and in the implications of bearing false witness, you know, were to uh, take on the punishment of the person that you are accusing. Um, that's in Deuteronomy chapter 19. So in many ways to me, this commandment is very much about seeking the peace and purity of the community of Israel. And, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge to us as the church to think about the peace and purity of the church as we take vows to join the church that's the fifth item, right, in the list, uh, the peace and purity of the church, as the elders and deacons take vows to be in their roles, that is the vow that we take. Um, and so in some ways, uh, for me, personally, this is a tough one. I just get to talk about the difficult commandments, I guess. <laughs> Which ones are you? Thank you. <laughs> So I'm going to throw out a question for you, and, and, and I'm going to ask myself this question because I have to. Have you taken the words of others and fashioned them in your mind to be something else, to be false, and then harbored some anger? or resentment, or something 
where you are actually being a false witness to yourself. And then it causes other problems, right? It turns into other sins like anger, aka murder. Hmm. I've been there. I've been doing that. You know, how, how can we speak honestly to ourselves? And how do we then find peace and purity in the church through that? And there's a passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, which I think is really helpful to me. It was helpful to me at 6 a.m. today. So hopefully it's helpful to you at, at whatever time it is, 1045. And, and Peter writes this, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Now, Peter's saying there, be at peace and have a pure relationship. Don't have disharmony or disruption in your relationships in the community that you're part of. Be at peace. And he goes on to write, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. So be at peace, don't be disruptive, be at harmony and bless even in the face of what might not seem right, what might seem evil or wrong. So be a blessing through serving, through praying for someone or being thankful for them. And then Peter goes on to quote from Psalm 34. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So may we be people who pursue peace and purity through our witness, one to another, and even in our own minds, that we might honor the Lord our God. We are guilty and violate this commandment and all the other commandments. So let's go to the Lord this morning with our confession of sin, which is based on Romans 3. Our great and glorious God, you who know and judge the secrets of every human heart, we do acknowledge and confess that we have followed our father Adam in revolting against your commandments. We have turned away from you and from your blessed presence and have reaped the misery of turning away from you, the very author of life. None of us is righteous, no, not one. None of us has understanding. None of us seeks God. Our throats are open graves. We use our tongues to deceive. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in our paths. And the way of peace we have not known. There is no fear of God before our eyes. We appeal to you through your great mercy made manifest in Jesus Christ, your obedient son, that you would forgive our sins for his sake, that you would make many righteous before of obedience, that where our sin has increased, your grace would abound, just as Christ was raised from the dead by your glory, so also may we walk in newness of life. Amen. Now here there's declaration of pardon from Isaiah 55. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly 
pardon. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we come before you, broken sinners in need of a savior, an imperfect church, as those who live a life struggling against your enemies, the devil, the world, and worldliness in our flesh. We have, of our own accord, no right to come before a holy and righteous God who can destroy both body and soul. But you have provided much, so much relief for us, and that you have sent your son, your only son, to come to earth, live a perfect life, fulfill all the law and the prophets, to die a cursed death on the cross and to cover us with his blood. He has become the propitiation of God's wrath for our sins. We now, in the name of Jesus, can come boldly and do come boldly before the throne of grace. We plead before you and beseech of you that you will enter our hearts, that you will take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. With thanksgiving in our hearts, we worship you this day. As the psalmist says, for you formed me in my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Lord, we are thankful for the many good court cases defending life in the womb. And we pr uh, pray, O oh Lord, for the expecting mothers that their uh, pregnancy would be a blessing. I pray for the Rodan's family visiting Sam in Idaho and for safe travels. And for the Tansies as they travel uh, prior to their full retirement from missions to the world in Spain. As uh, it's as James writes, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So we pray for uh, Janet Koskari, uh, the brother of Janet Koskari, who has colon cancer, and that it would not spread through the body and that surgery would be effective. Uh, we pray, Lord, for Sharon Fernie, uh, sorry, uh, Sh yeah, Sharon Fernie, as she fell and injured her arm, and uh, that's a very big struggle with JB and uh, we ask that your hand would be upon her. And for Sharon Souza, uh, with her injuries as well, O oh Lord, that you'd heal her. And we pray for uh, Paula Hamilton's dad as he's recovering and should be home by Tuesday. We pray that that would be uh, just as we've been told. Pray for Brendan Jorgensen of Crew for the uh, health of his family, as much sickness is going around and that it would not spread. And for Candy's brother and uh, sister-in-law, who were on a mission trip to Rwanda, returning home and uh, pray, Lord, for the people who tested positive for COVID who cannot return, and for the stress of the uh, the extended family members as they are uh, concerned about their family members. You, O oh Lord, have called us to spread the gospel among the nations, to care for the poor and destitute. We ask that you would bless these ongoing ministries and works of grace, that you would be honored and glorified through these. The Afghan settlement in New Hampshire that Murph and Lori are involved in, the grief share that has uh, becomes so large that it's almost difficult to run and may feel hasty, but you, O oh Lord, have provided a way, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, for Mid Middle East Reform Fellowship in Egypt, for the training and committed volunteers, uh, for new converts, for Indonesia, for the newly established FM radio community, for South Sudan, for uh, families as they are repairing buildings that were destroyed. Oh Lord, we ask that you would give us a heart that is not prone to wander, but to do your will, to seek your face, to ask for your blessings continually, to knock on the door to the throne room, that you would give us open ears and hearts. We know that you have provided for us a good message, one that is secured by your son, blessed by the Holy Spirit. We ask that you would bless the preaching, that Steve would not preach his words, but your words, that your glory would be magnified through it, and all God's people together said, amen. Great. So we have our first reading today. From Exodus 32, Old Testament. Let me just see here. Put my Bible someplace. Okay, there it is. How about that Bible? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good book. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Exodus uh, 32. So our, our Old Testament reading, we, we slowed down a bit 
in these uh, readings because chapter 32 is so important. We just wanted to look at it a little more slowly here. So today we're looking at uh, 15 through 20 and tonight message will be on, on these verses. And I just want to remind you that where we were, you know, that, that Moses was imploring the Lord for mercy, which was just so necessary because God had announced to Moses uh, that, they, that the people had gone against his ways. Now, on this passage, 15 through 20, we have Moses coming down the mountain and actually experiencing this. So it says, then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. I just want to mention one thing here. It, it talks about uh, burning in this passage, and that's something that's going to show up in 1 Corinthians 7 as well. There's a lot, a lot of different ways people can burn, can burn with anger. Uh, you, you can even burn in humiliation. There are a lot of different ways. And just like there's a lot of different ways to be passionate. They're not all bad. We actually want to be passionate about the right things, right? So that's Exodus 32 um, for us, 15 through 20. Now, uh, Matthew 16, just one verse in our gospel reading today. And this is something that we should be passionate about, I think. It's just thinking about um, the hope that we have of eternal life. That should, that should be a passion for us. I think sometimes we're just, we're too cool in our hearts about these things. It has to burn a little bit more. All right. Uh, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul. So that's that's important for us to think about. Then in James 1, just a, a few verses here. Again, we're we're going slowly through James because there's just so much there to think about. And the author is not just giving us a, a logical argument through, but he's bringing up different points of wisdom here. So we want to let each one have its day. So this is James 1, uh, 13 through 15. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire then desire, when it is, has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So you can think about that again, of a desire. You have a burning desire. If it's the wrong kind of desire, that actually leads you into sin and leads you on the pathway to death. It's, it's not a good thing for us. So we see the differences here. Will you stand now as we enter into the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 7? Lord willing, we're going to take 10 weeks to go through 1 Corinthians 7. Reason is there's just so much here. And while on one hand, speaking of temptation, it's tempting to think, why don't I just do this all in one quick message? <laughs> you know, because of the nature of the things being discussed, you think, well, let me move quickly through this. But it's too important, really, for us to, and, and, it's, and it's here in some detail for us to actually look at. 
So 1 Corinthians 7, we look at the first five verses here. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. It literally says not to touch a woman. That's a, a, a bit of a, an expression so translated now for us, not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And likewise, the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement, for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Please be seated. So this is, is just a, a great passage. The whole of the book is interesting. Uh, we're going to get to the single life as a gift from God. We're going to get to that in future passages. Here, I just want you to know that that's not something that Paul is ignoring. Of course, Paul is a single man. And he also considers the single life to be a great gift. There's also the notion of being symbol, single for a season, for a time, but looking toward marriage. You know, so all of those things are reality. And then there's the reality of being married and then finding oneself single again. So that's, that's another reality. So where do we start with all of this? This whole biblical topic which Paul's remarks, we'd have to say, very practical, very practical remarks. And we'll see that as we go through the chapter. But the story of intimacy and marriage is not only practical, it's highly theological, right? That there's a, there's a bigger story that's going on that has to do with God. So when I say it's highly theological, that's what I mean, that there's a God story going on. And it really begins back in the first book of the Bible, second chapter, Genesis 2, 24, where it talks about the man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife or be joined, it says in the ESV, be joined to his wife. And the two shall be what? One flesh, right? They shall be one flesh. And this we learn through the Bible is not only that God has instituted this special relationship here right at the beginning of the Bible uh, for, for us and for good. This is before sin had entered into the world. Uh, but also that both in the Old Testament and, and in the New Testament, we're told that this is one of God's favorite ways to describe his own committed relationship with his people. What a shock, really, uh, that God speaks about cleaving to Israel and that Israel is to cleave to him. And that that's certainly Ephesians 5 and Revelation 21 is something we're to think about in terms of the church and ultimately the whole people of God, that Christ is a husband and that we are a bride. So all of this is in view as we begin these 10 messages. And first, what we want to do in these five verses here, uh, we're going to especially focus, by the way, on verses three and four. But first, what we want to do is to see what this all meant to the Corinthian church. What was Paul saying to the Corinthian church? We don't want to immediately jump to ourselves. Now, of course, in your minds, you're going to be doing that, and that's fine. You're, yeah, there's no way around that. You're going to hear me say certain things, and you'll be making application. That's great. That's great, and it's as it should be. But, but what I need to do is make sure I'm actually proclaiming to you what it says here that Paul wrote to the church. Now, we immediately have a bit of a difficulty because he says he's responding to a letter that they wrote. We don't have the letter. And even beyond the letter, we don't know all of the situation that he's writing about. But one thing that we do see 
in Old and New Testaments is that sometimes people are in committed covenantal relationships and they're trying to figure out ways out of them. That's one of, one of the things that people do. And they wondered if they might have some support from Paul on that as a single man, that he might be sympathetic to the idea. So throughout this chapter, he's dealing with that issue. So what I want to point out are really two things here. Um, first is in verse uh, three, holy matrimony includes an expectation of fruitful and joyful intimacy as really a gift of God and part of his plan for his people and for the whole world. And it's translated here, these words conjugal rights. And you probably might've thought as you're reading that, I bet it doesn't say that in the Greek and you'd be right. <laughs> this almost sounds like prison visitation here for us. So we're used to maybe using that word very sparingly conjugal and what, what exactly does this mean? Now, literally, this is what it says. Deliver what is due. That in this covenantal arrangement, there, is, there are right expectations. And that the person, whether husband or wife, needs to make sure that they're actually delivering what is due. Now, particularly when people are trying to figure out a way out of uh, a relationship, Th this might be something that they just decide to, to stop doing. Let me not deliver any more what is due. And that has its own way of breaking apart what should really be together. So deliver what is due. Don't deny yourselves. Let me just state it positively here. Don't deny yourselves at least two blessings. I wanted to point out two blessings here that are really all over the scriptures. Normally, and by the way, throughout this chapter, we just have to recognize there are all kinds of specific cases that elders need to have wisdom on and individual Christians need to have wisdom on. So it's not like everything is just such a hard and fast rule that we can say in every situation, this is absolutely right. No, that's not the way it is. So recognize what we're saying. Normally, this is the way that things are, but look at every situation individually and show real care for people. Uh, as individuals, as you try and understand the brokenness of the world we're in. Okay, so I said there's two blessings normally that happen uh, in marriage. One, deliver what is due in this sense, deliver the possibility of fruitful procreation. And as an example of this, I think of the Old Testament woman, Hannah. Remember her story. Now, this was back in a day of polygamy. So Hannah was one wife, of the of her husband but he had another wife this other wife is very fruitful as a, a lot of children and here's hannah she's desperate what if her husband had said you know what i i'm just not going to have any more intimacy with you at all of course it, it would have been a heartbreak why because hannah was actually looking for the blessing of future generations generations of something fruitful that would come. And so we find her there pleading before God for this good gift. And her husband, of course, he loves her and, and cares for her. So deliver what is due in terms of the possibility of, of fruitful procreation, because if one denies another on that matter, well, there will be no fruitful procreation from that union, all right? But there's a second thing, and sometimes I think we, we could get just almost... Uh, you know, we'd lose all the joy out of everything, you know, as if we were just because it's just about having babies. Well, it is about having babies, but it's about more than that. And the Bible tells us it's about more of it. So deliver what is due also means the possibility of joyful intimacy, one with another. And I highlighted Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, all three of these books really have a lot of different verses in them that talk about this aspect of husband and wife being together. This is not just about having children, that it also is things like this, rejoice in the wife of your youth, right? You, you need to, to, to let her really be a, very satisfying to you. And, and that for all of your marital life. 
normally. That's the normal way. And that's in Proverbs. So that's a, that's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, idea. And it's reinforced in many different ways in the Bible. So that's our first point uh, that Paul would have been making to the Corinthian church. He's, he's writing to this church, given their situation, given the fact that they might actually be looking for ways out of their covenant commitment. He says, look, number one, this arrangement involves fruitful and joyful intimacy. And please, brothers and sisters, he's saying to the church at Corinth, deliver what is due. Deliver what is due. Okay, secondly, in holy matrimony, and now I've quoted from Song of Solomon, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I've even preached on those words, but I hadn't really fully considered those words before. You know, they're very... Um, common words. If you look online and you look up Song of Solomon 6.3, you're going to find a lot of jewelry for sale. And, <laughs> and it'll say in Hebrew, Ani Vadoti Vadoti Lee. Uh, and what it, it literally means, I for my friend and my friend for me. It's beautiful. And so people often are getting married. They might want that uh, to be something that's preached on, or whatever it is, it's sort of recognizing that there's something there that's so beautiful, beautiful, and so mutual, but Paul helps us to see it in a different way. So what does he write in verse four? The wife does not have authority over her own body. What? <laughs> that's what? <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but, but the husband does. <laughs> Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Where else in the world would you ever get that teaching? <laughs> so this is something that's being told to the Corinthian church. And, it, you know, we're all owned by the Lord. So we could have just said that because, in fact, Paul said that just in the verses that went before this. He, he, he said that you're, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. So he's already dealt with the big issue of the Lord actually is the owner over all of us. But then he said, look, if you enter into this marital union, understand that what's happening is real. And that what you're doing is that if you're a woman, you're saying, this, this man has authority over my body. If you feel uncomfortable about that, do not get married to that man, right? That you, that's not the, if you feel, I cannot trust that man with my body, right? That's understandable. Don't marry that person then, right? And the same for the man and the woman the other way. So this, I think, is what is there in Song of Solomon 6.3. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. So it's a tremendous relationship of trust there. And trust can easily be broken. And we can find ourselves in horribly broken situations where we say I can no longer uh, be in that situation because of the brokenness of the marriage that's actually taken place because of uh, the infidelity that can happen. So what we see here is an astounding revelation. Your body is not yours. See, I think if we were to say, look, what's the prevailing ethic that maybe would have been there in the Corinthian church? It, it would have been a very natural thought that I own me, right? That's a very natural thought. I think in any society, sometimes we live in perhaps societies where it's there's a very strong central authority. And then we, we may be taught something else. The central authority owns me. They own my body. They command everything about me. But I don't think Corinth was that way. I think Corinth was much more on, on the order of I own me. Now, sometimes in very patriarchal societies, there may have been an idea that the husband had authority over his wife. But where has it ever been said that the wife had authority over her husband's body. First Corinthians seven is where it says that. I'm just not aware of anything like that. That's so mutual, so full of trust, so full of Song of Solomon 6.3, I for my friend and my friend 
from me. All right. So therefore, Corinthian church is saying, don't deprive. And it literally says, don't defraud the other one. Because what you have here is a real decision that has been made uh, before God, before a covenant community, that what you're, you're saying is that we are together in this covenant of marriage. I for my beloved and my beloved for me. So don't defraud because there's a right expectation of fruitful procreation, at least the possibility, and joyful intimacy, at least the possibility of that. Don't defraud one another of that and instead recognize that mutual relationship as being good and truly a gift of God. Now, next week, we'll look and say, look, singleness is a gift of God. That is true. We'll explore that further. Um, but here's the problem that some people have decided to combine the best of both worlds, they thought, and, and be very, very religious about it. So we'll be together, we'll be in this covenant of marriage, but we'll be celibate. That may not sound particularly attractive to you, but to many people throughout the history of the church, that's been a big deal. Where they've thought, no, if I'm really holy, I will be celibate in marriage. And even there were pastors that were encouraging people in that direction. And we have to say here, based on this passage and what, what uh, Paul says, particularly in verse five, look, celibacy in marriage is not a healthy norm. Again, I said norm. It's not a healthy norm. It's not a good goal that somehow we'll come together, but then we'll be celibate. All right. Uh, so he does say, well, here's, an, uh, here's a special Here's a special instance. Maybe it's not the only one, but he says, except for perhaps by agreement, okay, not something that one does by oneself, but by agreement between the two parties for a limited time and for prayer, but then come together again. Why? Well, now we see it's almost like the heavens opened up and the warfare that's there between good and evil is more visible to us. It says, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So that something that could actually happen in my own choice and in our marriage, right? That could actually be part of a strategy of the evil empire to bring down a marriage and a church and others around an extended family by doing that. All right. And then we start to think about it back to Genesis 2 and think, hmm, wonder if this has something then to do with the whole bigger story issue of what God was doing and having marriage and what's going on here. So then consider this. Maybe this would help a little bit. Obviously, he's telling us some things we have to obey here. Right. We have to obey these things that he's saying. But is this just for obedience? Is this just another way of saying, here, I want to give you two more laws. And here they are. Uh, here's something that you need to do. Here's, how, here's the way you need to think about it. it. Two more laws. Or is it instead not only for obedience, but for faith? That somehow this is related to what your faith is all about. And the one in whom you have faith. And where your hope is. All right. So again, we go back and say, well, where did marriage come from? It's very clear. This is God who instituted marriage. And where is it going? And we look at that pathway of Christ coming and his singleness and the cross and the ultimate goal of all of this. Why would God give us practical, intimate instructions concerning marriage? Because apparently it's a showcase of what we believe, of what we believe about our God, who's not saying, I'm some distant person. Here's some things I've written down for you. You better obey them or you get crushed. Was well, truth in all of that, you know? But, but that's not, instead, he's saying something else. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have bought you and you are mine. And it's something beautiful, something good, rather than something abusive that we'd have to run away from. 
There are abusive things in this world. There are some things we do need to run away from, even just to stay alive. Isn't that the case? Right? And we don't want to be saying to people in those situations, look, you have to stay in this situation. Wait, well, let, let's, let's look at the specifics. Let's, let's talk about that. But instead, you know, what we're looking for positively here now is to say, let's stay and be together and let's let uh, uh, come from our lives something so beautiful that gives a testimony to what we actually believe. Now we're ready for the point here, okay? We've seen uh, what it is that Paul, I think, is saying to the Corinthian church, and I think they were probably very surprised <laughs> to start getting this. They thought they might have a way to do what they wanted to do in all of this, and instead, he's, he, he, here's this single man telling them something else. Well, what's the point? Christ, the husband of the church, cares deeply about our marriages. Even if you're a single person here today, yet you need to care about the marriages in this church and beyond this church. You need to be so in favor of what Christ is doing with his bride that you say, I want to do everything in my power that I can actually work toward the continuity of blessed marriages, all right? And, and so then now, what is God saying to us in these verses? We've looked primarily at what Paul was saying to the Corinthian church in these verses, although I couldn't resist telling you some other things along the way, probably. But but what is God saying to us? couple quick points. One, if Jesus cares about our marriages, so must we. So nurture that marriage and give within that marriage. Here's something I love from 1552. With this ring, I thee wed. With my body, I thee worship. And with all my worldly goods, I thee endow. So the whole commitment that we have there, that we've made, this we have done, right? It's beautiful to be able to say, with my body, I thee worship. But that includes more than just some small definition of the body. And that takes me to the second application. And here's what it is. There are important principles about honorable marriages that we can only get in the Bible. We really have to look there for them and, and be open to it. So as we go over the rest of these nine messages, just be open in your heart to say, look, what is God actually saying? What's he saying to the Corinthian church? What's he saying to us? And hear what he said. One of, one of our first ones is deliver what is due. And that that's part of a bigger story. And, and we need to take a larger view of what is due. All right. Think, for a, think, think about this, for instance. How about the body part of the ear, gentlemen? Are you ready to give your ear to the wife that you've been given? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you. If you give your ear to another woman more than you would give to your wife, watch out because soon you'll give your body to her too. That's the way that works. What about your eye too? Right. Give your eye to your wife. Look at what she would have you look at. Listen to what she would have you listen to, right? And of course, you can make the applications in your own life. So what are we really after? God is saying, have a real relationship. Have a real relationship with your mind, with your speech, with your actions, with all that you are and all that you have. And the reason why I want you to have that real relationship is that I intend to have a real relationship with you. And I won't take no for an answer, right? Like, see, you better have, look, if you talk about somebody not saying, I won't take no for an answer, you better be able to trust that person. Because there are abusive people who say, I won't take no for an answer. And, and we have to, again, we have to run away from people like that. But when it's our God who gave himself for us, 
who died on the cross for our sins. And he says, I, my love, I won't take no for an answer. Then we surrender to him, you know. So uh, final, final thought here. And don't lose this thought in the midst of too many details. Because, you know, when I preach a sermon like this, who knows all the directions your minds are going, right? Right? You're thinking about different things. That's fine. And you probably have to. You have to think about these various things and how it relates to you. I'm glad you are thinking that way. But in the midst of all those details, just remember this. Your best day is coming. You know, it's fine to get engaged, but I think it's really special when you set the date right it's just something that makes it a little more clear so we're engaged but we set the date the thing about this is you and i haven't been told the date yet but he knows now there was a day he said i didn't know that the, the the time and even the son of man does not know now he knows now he knows and he's committed he's absolutely committed he's not going to change his mind that day is coming it's sure once again you can trust him with that, let your heart be set on that day. You don't know the date. You just know that day is coming. And, and how do you know? It's sealed in the blood that he himself shed for you. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this chapter. And thank you for the whole of the scriptures that enables us to look at this in the right way. And Lord, we pray that you would do what only you could do by your Holy Spirit that you would do a work of power in our lives and maybe over the course of these summer months, just seeing different things, maybe in a different way. It might help us in good ways. We pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So hymn 529, will you stand? Lead me, Lord, lead me in thy righteousness. sisters what do we believe together we believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible and in one lord jesus christ the only begotten son of god begotten of his father before all worlds god of god light of light very god of very god begotten not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again 
according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end and we believe in the holy spirit the lord and giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son who with the father and the son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets and we believe in one holy catholic and apostolic church we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come amen please be seated as we prepare to celebrate the lord's supper here today uh, I want to read to you a couple of verses from Matthew's gospel that I've already read, and then one that I haven't read yet, and then focus on that last one, Matthew 27, 48, and 49, and then 50. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. But here's the part I want to focus on today as we prepare to, to eat the bread and drink the cup. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. You know, it's just amazing. This is what we were waiting for. And it's just so simply stated. Jesus came into this world in order to live, but then to die. And this is the moment here that describes his death and the sacrament that we enjoy here today. Paul says that when you eat that bread and drink that cup, you proclaim what? The Lord's death until he comes. Well, this is it right here. So how is it described here? It says here that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. What would that have sounded like at that moment? You know, you had those three hours of darkness, everything else that's happening here and what's about to happen. And then this cry comes out from the one through whom everything was made, the one who is the redeemer for us. What would that sound have been like? I could tell you this. It would have been sincere. Uh, it, it would have been a, a full, a full giving of himself. And then the last thing it says, he yielded up his spirit. That's very interesting. It's like, it's like his life wasn't ripped away from him. He freely gave it up. And all of the account points in that direction. I just wanted to say this, just kind of bring us back as we come to this table here today, to these words from 1552, that Jesus, I think, is saying to his church at this moment in that cry, with my body, I the worship. Shocking. Because we say, wait, we with our bodies worship you. We offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice, right? And yet Jesus, in this sense of the vow there, is, is saying, I give my all right now to you. And that's, that's what he's done. And because of that, for those who have professed faith, and you really need to have professed faith in order to partake in the Lord's Supper. For those who have professed faith in Christ and really believe that this is what he did. He actually gave his all as the best of all husbands there. This is where he, he proved his love for us. If you believe that and you've been admitted to this or some other church of Jesus Christ, with you've had to profess your faith in order to be at the table of the Lord, please partake of this food, even though you may be weak right now, because who's not weak here? We're all weak. We just listened to that sermon. That was enough, right? We listened to what Steve had to say about the ninth commandment. That was enough. It was a good word for us to think about, about false witness, how, how we even deceive ourselves in a strange way. Yeah. So we have plenty of sin. Don't wait until you're at some acceptable level of sinlessness to eat the, the uh, Lord's Supper. That's silly, right? But instead recognize, no, this is the place where sinners go. All right. 
This is where you go. If you've not professed faith in Christ, you haven't been admitted to the table of the Lord, I just want to urge you to do that. Where are you going to find a better husband than this? This is the best. This is really the best. There's no better hope for any of us. So that's, that's, my, that's the closest we come to an altar call, right? Stay in your seats. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I, want you to, I want you to think about that. If you haven't done, for some reason you haven't, please come, come to the, come and see and, and let's talk and profess your faith in Christ. All right. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing as we would partake here. Father, we thank you for the glorious name of our Redeemer, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the, the great I am come in the flesh to live and die for, for us. And now, Lord, take these elements of the bread and the cup and remove them from their normal purposes now to this particular purpose that you have, that we might know somehow that you're present with us. And Lord, again, we don't understand this. We don't. We just receive. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that ever mortals knew, that angels ever bore. All are too poor to speak his worth, too poor to set my Savior forth. Great prophet of my God, my tongue would bless thy name by thee, the joyful news of our salvation came, the joyful news of sins forgiven, of hell subdued, and peace with heaven. Jesus, my great high priest, offered his blood and died. My guilty conscience seeks no sacrifice beside his powerful blood did once atone, and now it pleads before the throne. Thou art my counselor, my pattern, and my guide, and thou my shepherd art, O keep me near thy side, nor let my feet e'er turn astray to wander in the crooked way. My Savior and my Lord, my conqueror and my king, thy scepter and thy sword, thy reigning grace, I sing. Thine is the power. Behold, I sit in willing bonds beneath thy feet. And this is from Matthew 11. Just from the end of that, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you 
rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And uh, I would hate for it to be the case that you would leave a service of worship today and just be in such turmoil of soul. I know some days we maybe need that. We're moving from one place to another and we have to go through some turmoil maybe, but I would love you to have rests. Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and Christ says, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. You know, I was, I was listening to Ernie's message a couple of weeks ago, and he, he was talking about the doxology, the tune of the doxology. And he said, you know, we sing that every week. And I realized, no, we don't sing that at all anymore. <laughs> we used to sing it. Let's stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen which has the added benefit that it gives Laura a chance to get to the piano. Hymn 377, join all the glorious names. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that ever mortals knew, that angels ever bore. All are too poor to speak his word, too poor to set my Savior for Great prophet of my God, my tongue would bless thy name by thee the joyful news of our salvation came the joyful news of sins forgiven of hell subdued and peace with hell jesus my great high priest offered his blood and died my guilty conscience seeks no sacrifice beside his powerful blood did once atone and now it pleads before the throne thou art my counselor my pattern and my guide and thou my shepherd art oh keep me near thy side nor let my feet e'er turn astray to wander in the crooked way my savior and my lord 
my conqueror and my king, thy scepter and thy sword, thy reigning grace I sing. Thine is the power, behold I sit in willing bonds beneath thy feet. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen.